Today we've got two sessions that follow our keynote speaker and we're going to start with Peter Hunt, who's the managing partner of Mutuo. Um, there's an interesting bio. Um, I, I was aware of his uh, involvement with the co-op party, but I didn't know he was a co-founder of Supporters Direct. So uh, we've been having an in interesting conversation just in, in the run up to this. Um, and I think uh, the thing to point out is that Peter takes a very broad view of the cooperative mutual economy compared to other organizations uh, that, are, that are in that space. Um, and I think he'll reflect that in his talk today with us. So let me hand over to you, Peter, and you can introduce yourself some more uh, and then away with your presentation. And we'll take questions after Peter is finished. Great, well, thank you, Rory, and, and thank you, um, Elizabeth and, and everybody else, you know, for the uh, invitation. Very grateful to be invited to uh, share a few thoughts with you today and uh, hopefully stir things up uh, a little bit, um, as is my uh, reputation. So um, for those who don't know um, anything about Mutuo, um, I will, oh, I should start with the, with the title of what I'm going to talk about. I mean, basically, as Rory said, might take a very broad view of, um, of the definition of the, of the sector um, to involve all types of cooperative and mutual organizations. And when I talk about global cooperation between cooperatives, I mean, I'm talking about all of those different types of organizations. And I'll say a bit more about that uh, as we go forward. Um, but today I wanted to focus in on why this is um, so much more important than just something that we all sign up to and think is a good idea um, that actually makes a big difference to the success or otherwise of, of our sector. Um, I and mean, for those who, who don't know anything about, about Mutuo, um, if I can move the slides, um, yeah, here we go. So <clears throat> we were established in 2001, so 20 years this November um, is our anniversary. It's hard to believe, given how young and fresh I look, that um, we've been at it for two decades. Um, but the simple way of describing what we do um, is that we try to improve the business environment for cooperatives and mutuals and I'll, I'll explain more about that through the examples of the projects that we've been involved in uh, as we go through the presentation um, and we try and help these different types of businesses to uh, work together and we do this through this policy-led approach and, and I'll explain all of this as well um, and how that fits into um, the day-to-day -day work of different types of cooperative businesses. Um, and having been established in 2001, from about 2013 onwards, we uh, started working internationally because lots of the issues that we faced in the United Kingdom were shared in different parts of the world, almost you know, mirrored in many cases. Um, uh, but at the same time, there were huge lessons to be learned from other jurisdictions as well. And so we went on the road to um, to, 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 to learn and to share, I should say, really. Um, and since then, we've been working with businesses, trade bodies, think tanks, um, and cooperative organizations in all parts of, of the world. You know, um, North America, lots in um, the European mainland, but also uh, Caribbean, South America, um, South Africa, um, Asia and significantly uh, lots of work in Australia uh, over the last few years. Um, but as I say, you know, the objective is to try to improve the business environment. <clears throat> I'm to move these slides, but I don't know how. Uh, there we go. Um, so if we say we're trying to improve the business environment, what we want to achieve is for every country to have a world-class environment for co-ops and mutuals. That means that they've got the best legislative environment, the best regulatory environment, and the best possible policy understanding. And if you put all those things together, uh, you've got a chance of having a good uh, business environment. But it's gonna, re it's gonna be different in different countries. And I think right at the top of this, we need to reflect and accept that there are going to be very significant differences between countries, even though I'm talking about cooperation between cooperatives and I'm talking about issues that we share in common, 
there are big differences. So, for example, uh, a cooperative established in Rochdale in 1844 shares a name and a title with cooperatives established in central China in, you know, 1995, but they're very different animals. Um, and, you know, we respect in the international cooperative movement, we respect the differences uh, of those cultures and we respect that there are different ways of doing things that are not necessarily always the same. This helps my argument when I'm starting to talk about this broad base of co-op businesses, um, because we have a broad base of different cultural appreciations of cooperation uh, and how it's applied in different parts of the world. Um, at the same time, um, there are some shining lights around the world, some countries that have um, excellent cooperative um, business environments and they're places we can learn from. It might be we can only learn in a very small way from each of them because you couldn't necessarily pick up and apply what they've done in lots of other countries. So there's no standard in that respect that we're groping towards. We're not trying to find the holy grail of cooperation and then apply it uniformly in different parts of the world. What we have to do is to see um, which ideas are applicable to different countries and to um, different um, <coughs> cultural uh, and historic contexts uh, and see how they can be made to work in each of those cases. <coughs> Of course, you know, fundamentally, we're talking about, you know, the, the cooperative principle of cooperation among cooperatives. Now, if you go to the ICA and you ask uh, about this and you, you, you look at the website, and we probably all can, you know, memorize this and, um, and repeat it in our sleep, I'm sure. Um, but this is what it says. Um, and for me, this is, this is true, but a little bit narrow. Um, and I'm very much assisted by... Um, the late Professor Ian McPherson, who wrote a guidance note on the cooperative principles back in, I think, 1995, something like that. And when he was um, uh, looking at each of the principles, he described what it actually meant in practice. And so even though this talks about uh, cooperatives working together through local, national, regional and international structures, the full meaning of this principle is broader than that. It's about a collaborative nature, which we um, have together, where rather than being concerned with a particular entity or a particular structure or way of doing things, we're looking towards achieving an end, which we all share. Uh, and so working together in order to do that, it's just a natural thing to do. Um, and that gave rise over the whole history of cooperatives to cooperative federations, to secondary cooperatives, to all sorts of different uh, structural ways of achieving this end. But we should always remember that cooperatives are not just structures. They are, uh, uh, the structures are a means to achieving this shared uh, vision and this shared objective. Um, and so when we talk uh, at Mutual about cooperation among cooperatives, it's about all those things. It's about bilateral relationships. It's about groups coming together. It's about the national trade bodies which might be industry based or might be regionally based. Um, and it's about them working together on a broader regional basis, a global regional basis and an international um, basis at the top end through the ICA. So it's all those things. Um, so what, what, what's wrong? You know, well, why do we have to come together and do anything at all? If I, um, this is just a very short list. I mean, it could be much, much longer, but if I was looking at things that I've seen repeated in different parts of the world over the last few years, problems that are shared, problems that um, uh, are not just down to the, the difficulties in one particular country, these are some of the things that, uh, that, that you can see. Um, and fundamentally, yeah, the fundamental biggest difficulty in all of this um, is this lack of understanding of what a cooperative is, what cooperative business is for. I've always, um, I always looked at this and thought, well, actually, 
The real problem is that people don't understand capitalism. They don't understand how that operates. They don't really um, get the consequences of uh, business being operated on a capitalist, um, investor-led, investor-focused basis. And what that actually means for the outcomes for all different stakeholders. And if you can't understand that, it's going to be very difficult to understand um, about cooperatives. And I remember many, many, many years ago when I first started working in the cooperative sector, if you spoke to anybody and said, well, can you tell me what a cooperative is? They'll, they'll, they'll start describing the governance structure or they'll describe how, it, how it's organized. But that's secondary, surely, because a cooperative is about what you're trying to achieve together. What's the business purpose? What is the outcome that you want to achieve? And the mechanism is merely um, the framework in which uh, you operate. So this poor or patchy understanding pervades through society at all levels, everything from poor education at um, uh, school level or no education at school level uh, through to, um, you know, perhaps, you know, an hour in a business degree and nothing more to talk about mutuals um, at um, degree level. Um, and that then means that people who are um, trained to become the leaders of our countries um, don't really know anything about our sector unless they've had personal experience of being with uh, cooperatives and mutuals they don't really know what 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 it's all about they've not been educated and they don't know so that's the biggest challenge uh, that we face all the time we constantly have to uh, continue to explain what this is all about and why it's necessary and what it achieves and why it's different from other types of business. Um, so the consequences of that poor and patchy understanding are, are, are the following, you know, sort of bullet points there. You get an inflexibility of business frameworks where people think, oh, well, a business, yeah, that means a company, that means, you know, shareholder owned, that means that we're going to set up our legal structures or regulation structures for that type of business and it doesn't actually work very well for cooperatives um, which means that growth can be restricted it means there's no real flexibility around that and often in in some countries you're actually working um, to the wrong business framework uh, to try to develop co-ops um, if we look at ourselves for a moment as a as a sector internationally um, I think it's a fair criticism to say that many of the international representative bodies that we have are not relevant enough to the big co-ops. And I'm going to come on to, you know, the sort of question around all of that. I don't want to be over controversial about that point because I'm not blaming anybody for it. I think it's just the facts of life. But if you go along to um, lots of international cooperative events, um, you struggle to see senior executives walking around. You struggle to see... Um, people in, in positions of authority, uh, always um, in the cooperative sector, always involved and engaged in those uh, spaces. Now, that's not you know, entirely the case with everybody, but it is too much the case. Um, and so the relevance to these big co-ops is really important. It might be we're employing the wrong people in those co-ops, or it might be that they just don't understand why they should be cooperating in this way. Make it relevant. And this leads to um, uh, a, I struggled with this. I actually went to a synonym um, prompt um, to try to find the right word for this, but I don't even know if I've got the right words. It's a lack of unity. It's not disunity. It's a lack of unity or a fracturing into different constituent parts within the sector. Ultimately, cooperatives and mutuals are a type of business generically. Yeah, of course, there are differences between them. But what tends to be the most obvious place to cooperate is through industry um, strands. And so banks will understand one another and work together. Insurance mutuals will understand each other and work together. Agriculture, you name it, all the different business sectors will do that. And that means that there is less coming together across those uh, different strands. And that's a big issue, I think, for the success of the sector. And the last point I've made, and I'm gonna make more of this in a moment, is the threat of demutualization because the single biggest reason for the change in the size of the sector in any country at any time 
is the risk of demutualization. The good news, of course, is this doesn't happen everywhere, but it happens in too many places. Uh, and it's always driven by asset stripping. So that's, you know, for the sake of my um, uh, beginning, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm saying are some of the problems we need uh, to fix. So I'm going to talk about the imperative of global cooperation and why now more than ever it is more important for us to cooperate, not because of principle six, because it's something we should do, but because this is about life and death, because this is about the growth of the sector. It's about all the things we need in terms of understanding uh, cooperatives and understanding mutuals um, so that we can then proselytize on behalf of our sector and make it into a better business environment. Uh, so I've picked three things. I could have picked any three things, but I picked these three because these are the ones that are uh, bugging me most uh, at the moment. And I'll start with the positive one, which is an opportunity. And the opportunity which is presented by this change in business that we're seeing now, this idea that business should be sustainable, that business should be not you know, the straightforward, Friedman-esque, neoliberal, um, um, Gordon Gecko, greed is good type of business, but it should have an eye to it consequences um, of its operations. The second is the threat of demutualization, which I think is ever present. And in fact, you know, the more successful you are, the more they want to come and get you because it's all about your assets. They want your assets. Wherever you go, they want your assets. And the threat of demutualization is very, very serious. Um, and then the third I wanted to um, talk about today was the need to innovate and change and develop the cooperative model. And too often, if I'm um, you know, introspective. You now, I think that the sector is um, uh, not open to change as much as it should be. Um, you know, we know what we know, we do things the way we do things, but actually I think that there are reasons to innovate and to change and develop the cooperative model in a way that will benefit all of us. And then what I'm going to do now is to give you uh, a bit more meat on those bones uh, of, of this argument. So sustainable business, let's start with the positive thing, the good thing. It is a good thing that the world is waking up to the impact that business has on its environment, on its people, on all of its different stakeholders. Um, and this idea that capitalism is moving on from this obsession with neoliberalism has to be welcomed by us. In many ways, you know, we felt like you know, we've been arguing against the tide. You know, the tide has been, oh, you need to make as much money as you can. You need to do it in as short as possible time and you need to feed your uh, shareholders. And that's the proper way to do business. And that's the paradigm that everybody has to, to work to, to. And cooperatives, well, you're not like that, you know, so you're somehow inferior businesses or something of the past or whatever. Um, accelerated by the global financial crisis. You know, there has clearly been a significant uh, change in, in the level of understanding and the limitations of that straightforward, you know, frankly stupid capitalist model. Um, that at the very least, there needs to be some kind of corporate diversity to manage risking economies and to spread that. But I mean, on the back of all of this, we have the you know, the urgent um, climate crisis, um, which is forcing single-handedly uh, businesses to change uh, the way that they operate. And the changes that we are all going to experience in the next 10, 20, 30 years are a genuine mega trend. And so when you see, um, and it might be that not everybody appreciates this yet, but I, I, I feel this very deeply, but when you see, um, discussions around environmental, social and governance criteria and the growth of ESG, it's not just flavor of the month. This is a big change and it means that business is going to change um, unrecognizably uh, across the whole board. And so it's to be welcomed. And it's a good thing that business cares about things that we've always been thinking about. But if you look at the cooperative sector, you'll 
you know, lots of people on this call will probably say, well, actually, you know, we were the original, you know, social businesses. You know, we exist because we are social businesses. And so, you know, this, this is just, you know, the world coming around to our way of thinking. But the problem in all of that is that um, the world thinks it's reinvented or it thinks it's invented a wheel. Um, and in developing standards, in developing reporting requirements, the risk for us as a sector is that we could be left behind uh, by all of this. And so in this opportunity of being really strong um, exponents of um, uh, ESG businesses and particularly social and governance, you know, strong businesses, um, we end up being bystanders while everybody else sets up how to do it. And the sustainability reporting and global standards and all of the new accounting standards that will be brought in will once again not reflect what cooperatives stand for. And we'll be standing at the sidelines saying, you forgot about us, you don't care about us, you don't understand us. You know, and I just don't think that we you know, can wait for that to happen. Because as soon as, as sure as night follows day, it will happen if we don't intervene. A good example of all of this is, is the growth of B corporations. Now, this is a very curious thing. Again, I'm in favour of B corporations. What a wonderful thing that a, a business should, you know, try to think about its, its, its uh, impact and think about um, all the different uh, effects it has on society and build a framework up um, to try to manage all of that. That's a good thing. But it's not a new idea um, and it's something that is being developed completely outside. I mean, I know quite a few cooperative and mutual businesses that have you know, gone down the B corporation line. Um, they're already mutual corporations. You know, they're already cooperative corporations, um, but they have to then, through this framework, conform to something which has been designed um, to do something different really, which is around the conflict, an inherent conflict between investor interests and all of the different stakeholders, which we've been arguing about you know, forever and a day. So with each of these three examples I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you uh, another idea of how to challenge all of this and, and what's going on uh, to do something about it. And this is where cooperation among cooperatives comes to life and starts to mean something. So on this one, um, if you can't see all the things on the right, you need to uh, minimize your, um, your grid. But this is a project which we're, we're now uh, just started this week, in fact. Um, and it's about trying to engage with the international organizations that are setting these standards so that they can reflect on and hopefully include the value, the inherent value of the cooperative business purpose. Um, because this business purpose is a completely different way of operating your firm. It's a different reason for being in business and it's a different way of being in business. And we wanna see that reflected in these standards. Um, they're being established now. Um, at the very least, we'll learn about the thinking behind all of them, but hopefully we'll be able to uh, influence that process. Um, I don't know if anybody saw, but um, the G7 has just set up a, a, a subcommittee to look at um, ESG standards, including business leaders, and they've put Monique LaRue uh, onto it. So the, the, the first sort of shaft of light really in this whole process is that we've got somebody in, in there who is at the top table who has personal experience. Monique was the um, chief executive of Desjardins Cooperative and the former president of the ICA. So to have her in there is at least a foot in the door, but we need to do more with businesses. And so what this project is all about is for businesses to get together. Um, there's a, a, a group of Australian um, cooperatives and mutuals who've got together uh, and they're talking to, uh, they were talking this week to the cooperative group in the UK, to um, Royal London Insurance in the UK, um, Medical Defence Union, all of these different types of crops and mutuals who all have a, a shared interest in actually challenging all of this. 
And so and I can say more about this through questions because I need to move on. But you know, this kind of approach shows how you can cooperate between different types of co-ops and mutuals in different sectors in different parts of the world because you've got a shared opportunity and a shared objective there. Demutualization, I've really got to watch the clock on this because I could go on for hours about this. This really winds me up. Um, demutualization, for anybody who's any doubt, and I'm not sure nobody on this call is in any doubt about it, but in any doubt, is all about getting hold of the legacy assets of the business. It's all about liberating those assets which have been built up by very large numbers of people in consumer cooperatives, over a long period of time and handing them out to a small number of people who did not contribute um, to um, the growth of those assets. There's three types of threats um, from executives who uh, think it's a great idea to enrich themselves from groups of members who feel likewise uh, or from and then more probably even more concerningly uh, more recently from private equity groups who are trying to get their hands on these assets and those Logos on the right are example of one of each of those, where Mountain Equipment in Canada, um, done over by its own executives, Economical Insurance done over by a group of um, self-interested members, um, and LV, Liverpool Victoria Friendly Society, um, as was, uh, done over by um, private equity. In all of these cases, these are all in the last year, they're all big, successful mutual businesses, and they are being lost to the sector um, because of the greed of others. So demutualization, we should remind ourselves, only happens in countries that permit it. Uh, and it's worse than permitting it because in those countries where there is a regime for demutualization, it tends to facilitate it as well. The regulatory system, the legislative system facilitates people getting their hands on these assets. And we don't like it. So we have to do something about it. There needs to be legislative security uh, around these assets as exists in, in, in France, as exists in most, to some degree, in about 25 European Union countries, but not in the UK. Um, the, the, the floor in legislation tends to reflect um, the imperialism of Britain um, and uh, in the countries where there uh, has been a, a legislation, legislative, legislative framework established, which originated in the UK, there tends to be the same um, flaw in it. Um, so what can we do about it? How can you cooperate out of this problem? Um, well, I'll give you a British example. So um, LV announced to their members that they'd actually sold, they'd agreed to sell the business. The first thing the members heard was the board had agreed to sell the business to Bain Capital. Quite astounding, given that less than a year before, um, the board had convinced the membership to vote to convert from a friendly society into a company limited by guarantee, still a mutual company, um, for flexibility reasons, when actually what it did is facilitated a clever legal ruse, which permits them to overrule, that's boring detail, but I'll tell you it, to overrule their, um, their own constitution. They can go to court and get a scheme of arrangement which will overrule their own constitution, which requires three quarters of the, of the members to vote in favor of demutualizing. So they can get around that um, and they, this whole thing has been managed in a way um, to make it easy for the LV leadership, which is the executives and the board, um, to do this. Um, so a group of um, interested friendly societies and mutual insurers came together with the all-party parliamentary group for mutuals, which we um, are the secretariat for, and we decided to do an inquiry into this and to shine light on what was actually happening and to produce a report, which you can see on our website, which pointed out the, um, you know, the, the blatant, um, let's call it theft, the transfer of, of assets, which have been built up over nearly 200 years by this uh, Friendly Society's members. And to transfer them to Bain Capital and a handful of individuals who will benefit by being on the board of the new entity. 
So they won't get cash in their hand, but they'll get promises of shares in the future, uh, which will make them very wealthy, no doubt. Um, here's a threat. Here's something that we could um, tear our hair out about, but actually we can do something about by uh, challenging it. And there's been a very significant media focus on this. It's been very supportive of the uh, mutual argument um, uh, in this case. This one isn't finished yet. You know, the, the, the dream would be to stop the demutualization. Um, whether that's possible, I don't know. Um, but taking it on and not standing back and allowing this to happen is really important. You know, I regret the other demutualizations in other countries. And I, I wonder openly whether it would have been possible to have a different outcome by challenging them and by the sector coming together as businesses and as representative organizations, as trade bodies to challenge them and to say, this is wrong, this shouldn't happen. And we wanna try and stop it and make sure that the assets stay where they belong. Um, moving swiftly, the, the next part of all of this is about what I would say is the need to innovate the cooperative model. Um, and not everybody agrees with me on this, I know this, but um, if you go back again to the Ian McPherson paper uh, where he described what the principles um, uh, of the cooperative sector actually stand for, what they mean, um, they have facilitated um, the growth of some very significant cooperatives over the years. Um, cooperative federations, just wouldn't happen without principle six. Um, groups of businesses coming together because they share a vision, because it's in their shared interest. It's a shared rational thing they want to achieve. Um, I would go further uh, and I would say that we need to be open to more hybrid models for different types of co-ops and mutuals. If something is more mutual than not, uh, to me, it's a good thing. Um, is it a cooperative? Not necessarily. That doesn't matter to me um, because more mutuality is a good thing um, and more cooperation is a good thing. Sometimes they will fit neatly into the um, legal structures that we have in different types of co-ops and mutuals and sometimes they just won't but we shouldn't be sniffy about those that don't. And you know a really good example of this is you know the debate back in the day oh it's a good 15, 16 years ago now when we were talking about the transfer of hospitals into foundation hospitals and you know the the grisly argument was well you you know the the mutual sector is facilitating the privatization of the national health service well that was absurd then and still absurd now because we have businesses that are still within the nhs but they are businesses with a balance sheet and they operate independently from the secretary of state for health and they have a membership and they have an open membership uh, and they have representatives and they have a representative structure and they're not cooperatives, but they are a type of mutual. And, you know, if you add up all of the different the numbers of people who've joined these foundation trusts over the years, you're looking at, you know, more than 3 million people have uh, been exposed to uh, a type of mutuality that they wouldn't have otherwise. So to me, we should have an open mind about that kind of thing. We should be happy uh, to see it. And, you know, at the same time as we are looking collectively at new business areas around platform co-ops, around, you know, the cooperatization of, you know, Ubers, deliver deliveries, whatever it is, you know, we should be open to this as well. I want to look at the capital raising and give you an example of how cooperation between cooperatives can actually make it make it work. Peter, I've got time. just to let you know, we've got about uh, 20 minutes left, so... That's all right. Um, okay. It's all right. I can whiz through a couple of my slides and not, not torture you with them, but I, won't, I will not whiz through this one because we succeeded with a new capital instrument for mutuals in Australia. Now, this is significant because in Australia, all of the cooperative legislation was thrown out in 2001. And the new Corporations Act that was introduced um, overrode all federal legislation 
um, for credit unions, for um, uh, cooperatives still are at state level, but not at any federal level. Any cooperative that operated federally had to become a company. Um, and everything was sat inside the Corporations Act. And so it was completely inadequate for the needs of the sector. It didn't represent anything. There were somersaults um, achieved through people's constitutions, but they still sat within a company structure, which was not designed for cooperatives and didn't benefit from any of the things that you'd want to see um, and you can see in lots of other jurisdictions. So um, a working group of um, interested businesses got together and worked out what they needed, what actually in practice did they need? And, and it, in a nutshell, it came down to this. They wanted to be able to issue shares which did not demutualize them so they could get external capital into their business without risking the mutual structure of the business. And the argument lasted four years. The project uh, went through peaks and troughs in that process, uh, but ultimately succeeded with federal legislation, which did two very significant things. Firstly, it achieved a new mutual capital instrument, which could be issued by mutuals. But secondly, and, and I would say more significantly, it defined in law what a mutual was. And it defined that one member, one vote was the defining feature of a mutual. And it defined that no demutualization could take place as a result of issuing any of these capital instruments. And so through the back door, we managed to get um, some closure on that debate. It's not finished yet, and it's the first steps, but that was the first positive piece of federal legislation in 20 years, achieved by a trade association working with um, about 12 different businesses who all put their collective heads together and their resources together to, uh, to fix this. So cooperation between cooperatives actually making a big difference. This is coalface stuff. I'm going to ignore these two slides for time. And I'll come back to this. So when you get a copy of the slides, you can, you can enjoy yourselves with the last two slides I didn't go over. But they're just about the methodology that we've it deployed. And it's a repetition of what I've said as to why we do things in that way. But if you look around the world um, and you, you see how we cooperate at the moment, um, we have these leadership projects, which I've described, which are really good, I think, in terms of cooperatives working out they've got a shared objective and coming together for a specific, specific reason. Um, we've got bilateral cooperation and the growth of um, uh, federal cooperatives, which is you know, common in most parts of the world. You start to get into um, this sort of disunity or lack of unity when you look at regional sectoral and national peak trade bodies. Now, this isn't the case for everywhere, because if you look at the United States, their representative body for cooperatives covers all sectors. But if you look at the UK, it doesn't. Um, we've still got separate bodies for uh, building societies. We've got separate bodies. I don't know how many bodies we've got for credit unions, but uh, there used to be quite a few. Um, we've got separate bodies for um, friendly societies, for all the different types of um, uh, subsectors. Um, and this makes us weaker. Um, in the United States, although all cooperatives are in one organization, they don't even know the mutual insurance companies, um, which is a massive part, actually, of the co-op and mutual sector in the USA. We did an event a good few years ago now where we invited both to the same room, and they'd never met. They'd never met. They thought, they thought that the cooperators were all sandal-wearing um, uh, lentil eaters, and the cooperators thought that the, um, the mutual insurers were all redneck lunatics from, from the Wild West. And you know, they were both right. Um, when it came down to it, um, they had loads in common, but they weren't working together. You know, they were separately going to Congress. I, if I had another hour, I could bore you about the problem in the UK, where we've got all these different sectors. That's why Mutual was established in the first place, which was to try to pick the issues where we should cooperate and to do so you know, through one body. Um, so 
again, I'm coming to the point of saying that internationally um, and nationally, it just seems more logical for a business to join its uh, industry group um, when actually it needs to cooperate beyond that. It needs to cooperate through regional bodies. Those regional bodies need to be much more relevant to the individual businesses. And then we can get the right people turning up to the meetings and participating in those because there's no reason why we shouldn't be um, uh, engaged at the highest level of global decision making um, and you know we've got a foot in the door as I said but we need to get further into that um, so I'm going to conclude um, and give time for questions um, I'll miss out that case study which is more proof that I'm right um, and instead I'll just leave you with some thoughts on global cooperation. The first thing I'd say is that this really is a burning platform, both of opportunity and of threat. Great opportunity with business turning towards thinking about its impacts, which is just right on our turf. We can respond to this. But it's also a threat because people are still after our assets and we need to protect them and we need to be able to see off those challenges. We have to work together to have this broader view of cooperation. I don't think we benefit from being narrowing our thinking. Um, I think we should be open and I think we should be um, accepting that cooperatives and mutuals have far more in common together than they do with listed companies and others and we should come together and work on that basis. And so those representative bodies should reflect this imperative. Um, and that way, we will have relevant bodies which large co-ops and mutuals can be active in and take a leadership role, can fund, can support, and can make them succeed together. I'll stop. Okay, that's wonderful. So, um, everybody gather your thoughts. So just a reminder, at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a button that should say reactions. And if you click on that, you should have an option to raise your hand. If you if you raise your hand, then I can give you the floor in order to um, talk. So are there any um, initial questions? We had one in the chat as you were talking, Peter. So can I introduce Munib, who had a, a, a query about, can you elaborate on what you mean by hybrid co-ops? So Munib, are you there? Yes, yes, uh, Dr. Ruri. Uh, good afternoon from Pakistan. Hello there. Uh, well, you've asked the hardest question of all because um, I guess. Um, yes, yes, please. Uh, should I repeat my question uh, or have you read it from the chat box? I didn't quite hear that, but I mean, I heard the heard the question that Rory put to me. But um, shall I answer that? Yeah, if I if I just return to the chat, yeah. uh, the the way it was expressed. Yeah, in the chat so uh, was, if if you are listening to me, please. Yeah, so please elaborate this concept and also how it can yeah. take a practical yes. form. Okay. Am I being here? Is that a clear enough uh, expression of yeah. your question? How, how can it take? How can hybrids take a practical form? Do you want to add anything, Munib? Yes, uh, if I'm being here. Can, can you people listen to me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. My question is that you mentioned hybrid model for the co-ops. So I want to, to please elaborate this concept and also as to how it can take a practical form. Okay. Well, look, I mean, um, I use hybrid as shorthand for um, types of structures that don't necessarily conform to um, a straightforward cooperative or mutual model, but will have a significant ownership stake on the basis of um, its principal um, owner. So uh, 
examples of this would be um, some joint ventures um, where there is a, a principal partner um, with um, perhaps government. Uh, you can have a, jo a, a joint venture between a cooperative or a mutual and government. You can have um, uh, different uh, stakeholder groups uh, involved, but it wouldn't necessarily be a pure mutual in that respect. And so my point is that if you are having a spectrum of these organizations with the purity of the straightforward cooperative on one end of it, you might have hybrid organizations on the other where there is mixed ownership, which would uh, draw people towards uh, being a cooperative. And it, most likely these are going to be partnerships with states and municipalities. Okay. Ian, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we can't hear you, Ian. Ian, it's breaking up. Can anybody else hear Ian? No, maybe no, it's... if you sign out and sign in. You could try switching your video off, Ian. You could try switching the video off and seeing if, if the bandwidth is better for your voice. Failing that, you could join, yeah, rejoin, yeah. Um, is there anybody else got a question while we just wait for Ian to rejoin? And there is a question from Grant that just popped up in the chat. Uh, which is, is a mutual a watered down cooperative, i.e. A, co a cooperative that doesn't access, doesn't um, attend to its values and principles? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you know, that's a kind of loaded question. Um, in, in many ways, um, it depends which part of the world you're in, how this language works. And, um, you know, we in the UK are fairly sort of lazy with our language and we use the term mutual as a sort of generic umbrella um, and that's not the case in lots of other countries so if you go to um, France or or to um, uh, Italy a mutual would be an insurance uh, company um, where people are mutually insured and it's very specifically that so across the European Union that tends to be um, the, the use of the term. Um, what's always struck me as curious is that, um, you know, there are very strong trade representative bodies um, for uh, mutual insurers, um, but they're not very well connected um, to the, the rest of what's going on. Even though technically ICMIF is part of the ICA, um, it's not actually uh, terribly connected to what's happening. Uh, and I will never forget um, going to um, uh, Cape Town when they had um, the ICMIF conference immediately after the ICA conference. And I was struck by just how few of the ICMIF delegates had been at the ICA event, even though it was in the same town uh, the week before. Um, so watered down is, is not the right term. Different is the term. Um, and um, a cooperative in pretty much every country is a very specific thing with very specific legal characteristics. Um, but the way I would put this is that, you know, a cooperative is a type of mutual, um, but it's a very specific uh, type of mutual. Okay. Ian, should we have another go? With your uh, how's that? Can you hear my yeah. dulcet tones now? Great. We can now, that's great. That's all right, hello, Good Peter. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I. I think I'm seen as a bit of a dissident these days, perhaps I always have been, but uh, I've been joined by um, Rita Rhodes, a former chair of SCS and an uh, uh, employee of the ICA and someone with a lot of encyclopedic knowledge about the movement. And she's asking, how did we get to where we are now, particularly in terms of the co-op group, which some might describe as a mutual uh, rather than a cooperative and uh, you know there's a long turgid history but I looked up today the the press release from Reuters in 2009 about the launch of uh, the super mutual which was co-op financial services and uh, the Britannia Building Society 
which ended up becoming uh, an albatross, which nearly took out the, the group. Now, in my reading, to try and get a better understanding of this, I've come across this story about Washington Mutual, which was the world's biggest bank failure. And nobody knows about it. <laughs> and uh, Washington Mutual was, was a bit like Britannia, only a lot worse. And, uh, and the, the problem was fudged in the US by the uh, then president, G.W. Bush, uh, overlooking the legislative requirement that was on the state to, to actually come in on behalf of Washington Mutual and allowed the sale, a fire sale to the biggest bank in the world. Is that Morgan Stanley, Morgan Chase? At, at you know at nothing cost but it got over a problem now i i'm a bit concerned that they i just wonder whether you, you were aware of the circumstances around washington mutual the biggest failure in in history uh, i'm not aware of washington mutual actually i was just taking a note of it and i'll become an expert on it within a few hours but but um no, it's called the lost bank the lost bank right okay yeah thanks Ian. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we need to distinguish between businesses that screw up and businesses that screw up because of their structure. And, you know, if you think about it, you know, I mean, you know, we haven't got time for the whole debate on this, but um, what was wrong with Britannia fundamentally was um, it was the delayed impact of the global financial crisis uh, on an asset book, which had been uh, wrongly signed off by um, its accountants at a value that did not reflect its true value. Um, it didn't happen because it was a building society, because lots of other building societies didn't have that problem. It happened because of those particular factors. And so you're always going to get in any business sector failures and you're going to get successes and Ideally, you know, you will have a structure which will help to work towards success, but there's no guarantees in all of this. And let's face it, you know, as much as Britannia turned out to be an albatross, um, it was the cooperative group, which was a cooperative, that um, took it in and merged with it. So, you know, you've got both of those structures at fault at the same time for the same thing. Um, and so I don't think, you know, that the failure of Lehman Brothers means that listed banks are a bad idea. Um, I don't think that the failure of um, cooperative financial services means that cooperative banks are a bad idea. Um, okay. I think that you get can good I, and bad I, in all these. Can I just come in, Peter? We've only got a, a couple of minutes left. Um, Nick Matthews has had his hand up and we've got one question in chat. If I just read the question in chat and then we take uh, Nick's point and then give you one last uh, chance to respond. So the question in chat was thinking of the MEC example. How was it that members seem to be the last to know about decisions that were made uh, and is member disengagement possibly one of the factors that facilitates demutualization? So Nick, do you want to add your query or your comment on top of that? And then we'll have one last point on that. I think, I think that Peter makes a, has made a very eloquent uh, presentation. Uh, I, I wish in many ways the audience was a bit bigger uh, and hopefully mm -hmm. we'll be able to share it uh, as it's been recorded yes, uh, to a wider audience because I think it's, it's, it is worthy of a much bigger uh community to listen to I, I think you're absolutely right on many of the challenges and uh, opportunities that we face at this moment in time and i think that part of our analysis has to be that one, one minute, that you've just, you've just one articulated minute. which is that differentiation between crap directors and managers and poor legal framework and poor uh you know fiduciary processes behind it I think you you know we 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 we've we've got two separate challenges. One is to generate better cooperative managers and directors, but separately to create that environment in which they're able to flourish. And I was going to ask you to say something, but you probably won't have time now, about the work you've been doing on getting fresh capital into cooperatives, which has been the bane of our life for many years now. 
Well, very quickly, um, on the first question, member disengagement is absolutely one of the reasons that demutualization happens. Um, members do need to be involved. If you don't have engagement, then you don't value the business, and so you're much more likely to accept some paltry bribe in the form of a windfall payment, which does not reflect your true interest in the business or indeed the purpose of the business and why those um, businesses were set up. And to answer Nick's point, thanks for that, Nick, because I mean, you know, it's really good debate, you know, and all this stuff uh, around the, um, all, all this stuff around the need to raise more capital and to adapt our legal structures is a live debate. And I don't know, I don't possess the answers to it, but what I've seen in one particular country, they've fixed it. In building societies in, in this country, they've fixed it. And, and the world hasn't ended for those institutions. There is new capital involved. It does not demutualize and it benefits the business. And the truth is, and I guess this is the last word I've got time for, when all of these structures were established, there was no expectation that there would be this huge need for capital in the way that we need now to compete in different marketplaces. So we have to adapt and we have to be prepared to do things in a different way from the Rochdale pioneers who did it the right way for them at the time. Okay.